My name is Justin Miller, author of the blog Sex and Psychology and the book Tell Me What You Want. And today I am interviewing two relationship experts, Drs. John and Julie Gottman. They are both clinical psychologists and co-founders of the Gottman Institute, where they conduct research and develop interventions designed to support people in troubled relationships, as well as to strengthen happy relationships. They have published a number of influential academic papers and books, with their latest being Eight Dates, Essential Conversations for a Lifetime of Love, which we're going to be talking about today. So let's get to it. Hi, John and Julie. Thank you for speaking with me today. Good morning, Justin. Hi, Justin. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. So I am a social psychologist by training, and I went to graduate school specifically to study the psychology of relationships. And a lot of my work in graduate school was focused on understanding the factors that promote committed and stable long-term relationships. So needless Mm -hmm. to say, uh, I spent a lot of time reading your work, and I've cited it many times over the years. Let me start with this question. In all of your years of studying relationships and working with couples, what do you think is the single biggest takeaway or the most important thing you've discovered? And I know it can be hard to narrow that down to just one thing. So if you want it to be a couple of things, that's fine as well. But what are some of the the key takeaways uh, that, that you found in your work? Well, one of the things that was very surprising to both Bob Levinson and, and me was that ratio of five positive to every one negative that really great, stable, happy relationships had, even during conflict. And that, that really surprised me, <laughs> you know, that, that a relationship had to be such a rich um, brew of affection, interest in one another, excitement, shared humor, all those kinds of positive things, even when they're disagreeing. Mm-hmm. And when we built the apartment lab, when Julie and I built the apartment lab in, at the University of Washington, and just had couples hanging out without any instructions and, and not conflict, that ratio of the stable, happy, newlywed couples we studied there escalated to 20 to 1. Wow. So I think it was one of the really big surprising things uh, in our research. What yeah. about for you, Joy? Um, I think uh, what wasn't so surprising, but parts of it really were, were the four horsemen of the apocalypse, you know, the big predictors of relationship demise, which are criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling, shutting down. But I think one of the the fascinating parts of that for John and me um, was that when couples were stonewalling, when an individual was stonewalling, just shutting down, not giving any signals of response to the other person, what they discovered, uh, John and Bob Levinson, is that the individuals were often in fight or flight. Um, even while they were sitting there, you wouldn't be able to see it. There'd be no differences on the surface, but what you would see is that heart rate was up around, uh, you know, 120, 140 beats a minute as they were quietly sitting there doing nothing. Uh, that was a real mind blower and it made sense of why people were shutting down, uh, which was that they were trying to self soothe they were going inwards to self-soothe this awful feeling of fight or flight. So that was fascinating too. Mm-hmm. And I think, Justin, you know, the, the final takeaway that the masters of relationships seem to have is that when their partner is experiencing negative emotions, you know, sadness, upset, uh, anger, you know, really being distressed in, in a great relationship, People seem to have the motto that when you're upset, the world stops and I listen. And I think that that sort of emotion acceptance is something that um, is probably the most important takeaway. I think what happens in a, in a great relationship, that emotional connection is there. Yeah, and that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. And um, I, I like those insights, and there are things that I have certainly cited from from your work over the years. My next question for you is, you, you both spend a lot of time sharing information on the science of relationships with the public. And uh, I know that you work with a lot of couples. So 
what are some of the big things that you see that people tend to get wrong about relationships? Some of the big myths and misconceptions. Is there any one in particular that comes to mind that, that you just tend to see over and over that people get wrong about relationships and maybe what makes for a, a good and healthy relationship? I put those into two categories, what people do wrong and what people think wrong. Uh, one, uh, in terms of what people think wrong that is such a common myth is that um, people should have a lot of stuff in common in order to make their relationships work. And uh, of course, all of the uh, pairings, you know, the couples uh, meetup sites uh, are based on that myth. Um, and it's wrong. The reality is that people typically um, are drawn to people very different than them. And that's a healthy thing mm -hmm. <laughs> for our genetics. It's good for our evolution. It's how uh, we've strengthened our species over time biologically. Uh, and so we're typically attracted to people who are very different from us and it enriches the relationship. Um, all right. So that's one myth. The other in terms of doing is that people think that they ought to bring up a problem in the relationship by describing what's wrong with the partner. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. And the partner really, really just really wants to hear that and wants to be, you know, invited for another conversation later in the week to hear more about what's wrong with them. I don't think so. So, you know, people really respond better when uh, the individual who's bringing up the issue describes themselves, describes their own feelings, their own positive needs, how the partner can shine for them, and describes neutrally the situation that they're upset about. Mm -hmm. So the formula that we've seen to be successful is I feel about what, and here's what my positive need is. That's really what works. And it's very different than the criticism a lot of people uh, begin with. Right. I, I, I love that. That's great information. Is there anything else that you wanted to add there, John? Well, one thing I'd like to add is that <clears throat> people think that if you love someone, that everything should be easy. It should come naturally and smoothly. It shouldn't require any work. Um, if you're in love and being in love is enough. And what we found is really that there are some, some basic skills that are necessary to make love work. And one of the most important one is really down regulating your own defensiveness. I know that's a problem for me all the time. You know, when Julie utters the four terrifying <laughs> words, we need to talk. <laughs> The first thing I got to do is really get out my notebook and work on myself so I'm not defensive. So I'm really communicating to her that, you know, because she's upset and wants to talk to me about something, um, I've got to get over myself. I've got to stop thinking, oh, you know, I've messed up again. You know, why is she so negative? And I've got to listen to her. <laughs> so I, that's the work in relationships is working on yourself so you're not defensive. So you can actually take in information in an open way. Um, and I think the myth is that you shouldn't have to work. You know, if you're in love, that should be enough. And it's just not enough. Mm -hmm. And that actually kind of ties into my next question. I wanted to talk a bit now about your, your new book, uh, Eight Dates. And um, there's a chapter I noticed in this book on conflict in relationships and how conflict is inevitable. But a lot of people approach relationships with the idea of a soulmate in mind, right? That there's this perfect partner for them and that everything should just go smoothly. So um, do you have any thoughts on this, this soulmate concept and whether that's a healthy or unhealthy way of approaching relationships? Oh, God. I love that question, Justin, uh, because we live on Orcas Island, which is kind of a magical place. And lots of couples that I've seen exactly speak that myth that their partner should be a soulmate. And, you know, I'm a nice Jewish girl here, married to a nice Jewish guy, and we're both realistic. <laughs> so we do not uh, 
buy into the myth that people have a soulmate, what they really have is somebody who has differences from them, who's going to disagree with them, who may struggle with them from time to time. And that is wonderful. That is wonderful. So if you can build a relationship where, as John likes to say, you can just sit down, enjoy a cup of coffee and a good pastry, you're doing well. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I think really um, when you do meet your soulmate, you know, when you have somebody, uh, you know, and I'm lucky enough to be in a relationship where, you know, I, love just gets better and better over time, then there still is work to do because when you have two separate brains, it's very unlikely you'll be in the same headspace at any one given time. Right. So miscommunications are just par for the course and <clears throat> repair is as good as, as it gets, mm -hmm. even if you're with your soulmate. Right. So, so tell me a little bit more about the new book. Um, in, in a nutshell, what would you say this book is about and who is it for? So here's what the book is about. Um, the book is a response to what John and I first saw in couples who were together for a long time and who were very distant, <clears throat> who were disconnected from one another, and who really hadn't followed the progression <clears throat> of their partner's growth and change over time and had lost track of who their partner was. And so what uh, this book helps with are deeper conversations, specific questions that really help people to reconnect with each other if they've been together for a long time. And in addition, we've designed the book for people who are just beginning to get to know each other. Early dates, early relationships, where what's happening is you are being guided to ask specific questions that we know really uh, unfold who the other person is, uncloak who the other person is, and allow people to go deeper into what we've seen over our decades of research um, are the most important things for people to be able to discuss. For example, that chapter on conflict is not, you know, let's help you have a conflict. It's not about that, right? Uh, let's duke it out. Yeah, let's do that in chapter two. No, it's not about that. Um, what it's about is what is your preferred style of having a conflict? What did you see growing up in your own family? Was that a style of conflict that you really like, that you've role modeled after, or is it a style that you really want to change, that you don't want to practice in your own relationship? What's that look like for you, and what would be your ideal? And, you know, I, Justin, I've been analyzing uh, data from 40,000 couples about to start couples therapy, and one of the striking things about that information is that 80% of them say that fun has come to die in their relationship. Mm. You know, they, they just aren't playing anymore. They're not having adventures. And so our data on play, fun, adventure is designed to really rekindle curiosity about what would be fun in their relationship, what would be a great adventure to have in their relationship, getting at their bucket lists of, of coming alive again. So that date is one of my favorite dates that we've designed. And that's one of the things I like about the book is that it's not just a guide to information on relationship research, but it's also kind of a workbook. And it gives people a, a lot of different ideas and things that they could practically try in their relationship. I also appreciated the fact that you talk about both same-sex couples and different sex couples uh, in your book and, and also in the research that you do. But I'm wondering, um, are there any differences in the relationship strategies or advice that you offer to couples based on their sexuality? Uh, or, or are the principles of relationship success really kind of the same uh, across couples? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a great question. So we actually tried these dates out 
with 300 couples, and there were gay couples and lesbian couples and heterosexual couples. There were 37 um, percent of the couples were really new to each other. They were just at the beginning stages of relationships. But 63 percent had been in long-term relationships, and uh, and they all recorded the dates. So we got to listen to 2,400 dates. <laughs> Some of the dates were duds. You know, we started with 12 dates and whittled it down to eight dates that really were fun and exciting. And I would say that uh, in our research on the differences between uh, gay and lesbian couples and heterosexual couples, mostly they're very similar. But there are some ways in which really gay and lesbian couples are stronger than heterosexual couples. They don't have the same power dynamics, it seems. They're, they're more likely to accept influence. There's more of a sense of humor. There's more openness, less defensiveness, particularly talking about sexual issues. Uh, gay and lesbian couples are much more open and less guarded than heterosexual couples. On the other hand, they have a lot more issues about their primary family growing up. We've seen that they suffer much more from a sense of rejection from their primary family and uh, and more likely to deal with individual issues of being despondent and struggling. But I, I, by and large, I think our observational research shows that gay and lesbian couples are much stronger than heterosexual couples. Speaking of sex, um, I'm, I'm someone who went from being more of a relationship researcher in, in graduate school to being more of a sex mm. researcher these days. And so um, there was a lot in your book that that stood out to me um, about uh, sex and sexual communication. I know you have a whole chapter on that. And so I, I know that a lot of my readers and listeners are very interested in that sexual communication piece in particular. And uh, so I'm curious, do you have any insight or advice that you would share uh, with regard to how couples Couples can improve sexual communication in their relationship when it comes to, say, getting what they want or or initiating sex? Well, you know, one of the things that has impressed me the most about this question of what does it take to have a great sex life? What does it take to keep romance and passion alive in a relationship <clears throat> to nurture desire is the study that was done that led to um, 70,000 couples being studied in 24 countries and the book, The Normal Bar. Mm -hmm. And what I took from that was a baker's dozen of habits of people who have a great sex life. And they're so simple. You know, it's really, you know, they, they say, I love you every day and mean it. They kiss one another passionately for no reason at all. They give compliments. They give surprise romantic gifts and they have dates and they cuddle often. And they express affection in public. And so, you know, it's not rocket science. <laughs> Having a sexual relationship seems to be the same as staying in touch, literally in touch with one another. Hmm. Let me also add that <clears throat> in the chapter in our book, Eight Dates, about sex and intimacy, of course, we're having couples have conversations about the kind of touch they like, what kind of erotic interaction they like, um, what is the best way to refuse having sex during a particular time without crushing the other person's ego. Um, so people are sharing about their own sexual communication. And one of the big findings we've also seen is that the couples who are able to talk about sex openly have more sex and more passion and pleasure in that sexual interaction. So, you know, one thing that we also did at the Gottman Institute is we produced uh, a package called Got Sex, which we didn't think of. That was so cute. <laughs> and um, it has uh, seven exercises that really help couples, uh, both heterosexual couples as well as gay and lesbian couples, discuss in more detail their own sexual uh, preferences, their own sexual history, you know, all kinds of things. So um, in this book, that's, you know, there is a piece of that that is incorporated into this book to help couples be more open, less repressed, 
and more comfortable really saying what they want and need and to be able to hear that from their partner without hearing it as criticism. Yeah, like we have 100 questions that you can ask a man about his erotic world and 100 questions you can ask a woman about her erotic world. So to build what we call a love map, uh, an erotic love map of your partner's inner world and have those kinds of conversations that quite often, particularly heterosexual couples, are very uncomfortable having. Something else I noticed in the book um, with regard to your discussion of sex is that you address some of the, the myths and misconceptions that people have about sex as well. And, and one that stood out to me is this idea, you said that it's a myth that sex is or should be deeply romantic. And I think that that's a really important point. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that? Yeah. Um, What we're talking about is, you know, people think that sex has to be perfect. It has to look like Hollywood. You know, you have to have fireworks. You have to have, um, you know, stars shining under the moon. And it's not 39 degrees outside as you're making love outside. It's, you know, always going to be 80 degrees and perfect. You know, it's just not realistic. So, people's sexual congress can look like all kinds of things. People can be playful. People can, you know, have a quickie. People can take their time if they want to. Um, Those at our age, in our generation, don't have to be um, sexual athletes, thank God. (laughs) Because I've had knees replaced now, and that's going to be kind of hard. So... (laughs) Um, you know, sex can be everything you want it to be. It doesn't always have to be romantic and perfect. And that gives a couple much more freedom to be expressive and creative in their sexual relationship. Mm-hmm. I, I love that advice so much. So th- thank you for sharing that. Um, uh Something else I wanted to to talk about with regard to sex is that your book is very much focused on what couples can do to improve their relationships. Um, but do you have any advice or insight into people who are, say, practicing consensual non-monogamy? Um, do you do any work with people who are in sexually open relationships? And, and if so, do you have any unique advice or relationship insights that you share with them? Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, we live on the West Coast, Justin, <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to Indiana, where the Kinsey Institute is. I don't know how things are out there, yeah. but um, there's a lot of polyamory here. Mm-hmm. There's uh, a lot of hookups, meetups, Tinder is popular, mm-hmm. and so on. Um, so, yes, we do encounter couples uh, who are sexually non monogamous or polyamorous. And I think, you know, the thing that we've seen is that um, uh, the couples who are practicing in those ways um, will have to be excellent communicators. They have to be the best communicators of all because they are sometimes dealing with feelings of insecurity and jealousy which are very tough feelings to deal with and to talk about um, with a person. And a lot of times what we've seen in non or open consent um, is that one person will be more open than the other. And that other is the one who is struggling with uh, those insecurities. Um, the other thing, though, is that people really have to have a very good conversation about either polyamory or um, open consent regarding non-monogamy. They have to be really, really clear about what the boundaries are um, and whether or not emotional connection with the other partners uh, is really allowed. Uh, Falling in love is really allowed because what we often see of course, is that we know that every time somebody has touched, let alone intercourse, oxytocin, the hormone of bonding is released, and that leads to feeling emotionally connected uh, with the person if the sexual experience has been a positive one. So people think they can maintain those 
you know, no falling in love boundaries, but it's incredibly hard to do if you're having repeated sex with some other partner. So that has to be also taken into account. One thing I want to say about that, uh, Justin, is also the, the work of uh, the great social psychologist, Carol Rusbolt, uh taught us so much about commitment and what commitment is about. And the important thing, I think, in a, a polyamorous relationship is that when you're feeling distant from your partner that you're committed to or, or there's been an argument with your partner, um, the important thing is to give voice to those complaints to your partner rather than talking to somebody else about those complaints. Uh, it's important to really be going to the partner you're committed with and saying, you know, here's, here's what I'm feeling in this relationship and here's what I need. So that's a very important thing to give voice to things when they're not going well. And also to avoid really thinking that the grass is greener somewhere else to not make neg negative comparisons between your partner and others, uh, even when things aren't going well. So don't run to somebody else in order to deal with problems in your relationship. It's one thing if you're uh, enhancing your relationship, a good relationship, by uh, including somebody else. Um, but if you're doing it, it to substitute for what's missing in the relationship, then it's going to jeopardize that primary relationship. So I think Carol Rusbolt has really helped us understand what commitment's about, what negative comparisons are about. You know, we want to nurture gratitude for what we have with our partner rather than resentment for mm -hmm. what's missing. I'm I'm so glad you brought up Carol Rustbolt because she's uh, she was actually my academic grandmother. Uh, my advisor oh, okay. in graduate school was was Chris Agnew, and he worked with oh. Carol in graduate school. So uh, she's she's part of my academic lineage, and um, I'm very familiar with with she's um, her heritage. body of work. Yep, I yeah. love her work. She's great. I think that's all great advice and information and insight, and especially what you said, Julie, about setting boundaries in relationships is really important, whether people are sexually open or not, especially when it comes to, you know, what is cheating and having a discussion about figuring out mm -hmm. where those boundaries and lines are. That's something that a lot of people just take for granted and assume that they're going to be on the same page about. Yeah. Well, the great thing about an open relationship is that there, you don't have the deception that uh, that cheating happens, you know, when it usually happens in a heterosexual couple or a same sex couple, you know, if there's all that deception, that is what's crippling about it all. Right. Well, I know that we're uh, out of time here. So I thank you very much, uh, Dr. John and uh, Dr. Julie Gottman for your time today and for this fascinating discussion. Uh, be sure to check out their new book, Eight Dates, Essential Conversations for a Lifetime of Love, which is in stores now. Also, be sure to check out my latest book, Tell Me What You Want, The Science of Sexual Desire and How It Can Help You Improve Your Sex Life. I think these two books would make great back-to-back -back relationship reading material. So check them out. And uh, thank you once again to the Gottman. Thank you.